and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us as we examine the evolution of the finding aid. Please note this webinar is being recorded. Do you find the data model of ArchiSpace different than how you're used to thinking of finding aids and you can't quite put your finger on why? Have you heard words like normalized and atomized and wondered how and why they apply to archival data? Do concepts built into ArchiSpace, like archival objects and top containers, seem a bit too unfamiliar to build confidence in your understanding of them? These are some of the areas that will be explored as we trace the evolution of the finding aid from a static singular document into a collection of linked data points. Presenting today, we have Valerie Adonisio. As the Description Management Archivist at Johns Hopkins University, Valerie's primary responsibility is managing and correcting legacy data and maintaining physical control for all archival holdings. She was tasked with migrating from Archivist Toolkit to ArchivesSpace from 2015 to 2016. Prior experience at Princeton University Libraries introduced her to the atomization of EAD, and further eye-opening experiences with the ArchivesSpace API led her to develop an API training workshop with Laura Woodford. Valerie hopes to leverage her experience learning these concepts to help narrow the sometimes scary gap between archivists and the technologies they rely on. Thank you all for joining us today. Valerie will now present how description, both legacy and new, has evolved, especially as it relates to the way information is stored and displayed in archive space. We'll hold for questions at the end. Hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. I am here today to present to you this webinar, which was just so excellently introduced. This is not a scholarly history of the finding aid, and it relies on some of my own experience. This means that I may use examples that you may not have directly worked with. I hope that the message comes across anyway. This presentation has a thesis. Get excited. Let's read it together. The transition from document to data is a conceptual transformation of how we think about descriptive information in a finding aid. In practical application, this involves the breaking down of singular, flat, human-interpreted information into multiple, linked, machine-readable data points. The advantage is that data stored in its smallest pieces can be infinitely manipulated. We'll be returning to this slide throughout. This presentation also presents an experience. I mean that just by sitting through the slides that I've provided, you're going to experience technological acceleration. Most of us may be familiar with Moore's Law, and if you're not, here it is. This predicted the acceleration of computational power over time. I'm bringing this up because Moore predicted this acceleration curve. Rather than computational power, I'm using this curve to relay that the complexity of storing archival description has increased over time. The examples I use in the beginning are rather basic, and then all of a sudden we're going to hit that acceleration curve, and like Moore's Law, we're all going to jump into complexity at a faster rate than the rate in which we got to that complexity. It will be disorienting. I cannot simplify that for you. I can only warn you about it. So here we are, everyone. Buckle up. Except, I'm not actually starting yet. I have significantly simplified not, simplified not only complexity, but also a long span of time. For those just being introduced to these concepts for the first time, this is intended as a simple linear progression from one concept to the, to the next, and as such is a simplification and a condensing of about 40 years of archival history. So remember that, and remember that it's not scholarly. What you see on the screen are the three examples that I will be using to walk us through the evolution of the finding aid. By the time we get to the end of the presentation, we won't really be talking about finding aids anymore, but bear with me, you just saw the warning slide. In the upper left, we have a representation of a paper finding aid. I am indeed starting at the beginning. I realize there may be some of you watching who still use paper finding aids. Welcome to the party. On the right is EAD, or Encoded Archival Description. I did not poll this audience, but I'm hoping or expecting that a majority of you have worked with or are still working with EAD, or have at least heard of it. But if not, don't worry, I'll be breaking that a bit down too. And the bottom is a screenshot from ArchivesSpace. However, 
This third category is not just archive space. It's a transition into storing data in a database. Database here can stand for Archon, Archivist Toolkit, or Archive Space, though AT users, Archivist Toolkit users, and ASpace users will be more familiar than Archon users with some of these shifts, at least as I understand them, since I wasn't an Archon user. So again, there is my presentation, there is my own experience kind of coming through, and I hope I hope we don't lose anyone. So as represented on this slide, it looks like a linear progression. I have special hesitation about this particular transition arrow the one you see there between EAD and databases. This implies that one is replacing the other, and that is not my intention. But hold that thought. I do have an intention. Please read these statements with me. Humans creating description for other humans. Humans encoding description for computers. And finally, computers storing and delivering data for humans. A very quick thank you to my colleague, Laura Woodford, who helped me distill this. Databases do not replace EAD, despite this slide, but this slide does help me propose that finding aids and EAD have more in common with each other than either has in common with a database. This conceptual change is like an event horizon, a point of no return, although of course you can always re-export into EAD. But what I'm trying to say is that there is a major shift there. So, Let's do a better job on representing this because EAD and databases were and still are meant to coexist. One does not replace the other. So let me make that really clear and reinforce the point. Maybe this is a better way of having thought about it. Keep this image in mind since we're gonna be returning to this as we go. One last note on evolution. This presentation will not capture all the scenarios that you may have experienced over the course of your career, or for those just entering the field, all that's come before. This slide represents just a fraction of the evolutions of the different format types that you may have worked with over time. And it also kind of captures the evolution from document to data. Spreadsheets, paper finding aids, HTML, PDFs, archivist toolkit. I can only try and help you interpret your work and ask yourself, when did I transition from document to data? Maybe you haven't yet. But if you feel like you can answer that question by the end of this presentation, then I've done what I've set out to do. So we begin with our first example in the land of Oz, known as the analog world, where things actually exist. I return briefly to the thesis and would like to bring your attention to the concept of being singular and the contrast between human interpreted and machine readable. I know that I'm starting off far in the past and with basic examples. Well, that is the key to building understanding, but I may lose you in the end anyway. So here we begin to explore the concepts mentioned in that thesis. Paper finding aids are singular and require human interpretation. Singularity as defined here is pretty basic. All I mean right now is that there was a one-to-one -one relationship between how many collections you had and how many finding aids you had. Later on, when singular documents evolve into multiple records, this concept will really get the spotlight. Flat, again, is something better considered when we contrast it with being linked. Right now, think of it as just not linked, which isn't terribly helpful, I know. My real focus is on the human readable or human necessary part I'm gonna to refer to this a few different ways, but generally the question is, did it require a human to understand it? So here's our happy example of a paper finding aid. Please note that I will be using the same fake collection throughout the course of the presentation. So this is the suitable example collection, and you can see some fake notes there. Another note, you'll hear me pause. I'm taking a water break, so one second. So I know I just said the title, of that collection. But what is the title of the collection in this finding aid? And more importantly, how do you know? Your brain sees the word title, interprets the space to the right of title, finds more characters that you recognize in it as English, and boom, you're able to discern the title of the collection. We are intelligent. Computers are not. Now you're going to think just a smidge harder. In which folder will you find correspondence from 1954? How do you know? 
here we go again. Your, your brain is parsing white space, indents, left to right text, and as well as a numerical span of the fourth dimension. You are brilliant. Computers are not. Remember, I warned you that we were going to start slow. Remember this feeling of ease now. It is an oversimplification to say that only humans can interpret this kind of information. On that note, if you still have legacy finding aids in Word documents or other static documents, Transmog may be the best news you get all day. I have to move quickly, but if you still have Word documents, run, don't walk, to get to this GitHub. So human necessary is an exaggeration, but of course it was meant to be for this presentation. So starting with this slide, I'm going to walk us through some of these changes by visualizing them. Here begins that visualization, which will evolve as we evolve. Please note the colors. Orange represents the collection or the top of the hierarchy. The blue circles represent our six folders of correspondence. Things are visually arranged into a hierarchy just like they were on paper, and that hierarchy only takes form once we apply our human brain to interpreting the white space and the indents. Also note that this, graph this graphical transition is not trying to convey any higher conceptual shift. On this slide, what you see is what you get. I'm really only setting the stage for our visualization as we go on. All I'm doing here is changing correspondence, you see on the left, to just the word folders so that we can abstract it a little bit from our specific collection to just collections. Again, I'm not trying to convey any higher shift on this slide. What you see is what you get. I'm just trying to set the stage. So there we have it. Here is a summary of what we've just explored, which admittedly was not a lot. Now we're going to explore machine readability and of course EAD or humans encoding description for computers. Welcome to EAD or structured markup. What does that mean? Here's our thesis again. We will now be thinking about machine readability or machine actionable information in a direct contrast to human interpreted information. We'll also be anticipating that data stored in its smallest pieces can be infinitely manipulated, though we're not quite to data yet. Here we go again. EAD finding aids are still singular. That hasn't changed. There's still a one-to-one -one relationship between how many collections you have and how many EAD files you have, unless you have version control problems. EAD is also still not linked. This is part of the reason for why I declared that paper and EAD are more similar to each other than they are to storing info in databases. But now we will explore the machine. So structured markup and encoding are super jargony, but I'm still using them. You'll hear me use some jargon throughout and then try to define it. I'd rather use it and try and define it than not use it at all. If you don't know these words, let's learn them. Here's the title of our fake collection again. The challenge is now telling a computer that this is the title in a repeatable, reliable, standardized way. Behold, EAD. We call this markup or tags or elements, but it's easy to see that by wrapping this information in other information, we are giving it additional meaning. Doing this is the act of encoding, and encoding is what results in markup. But I said structured markup not just markup. Here we are again. Let's add that structure. So EAD files are broken into two sections, top matter or the info about the collection and the description or the container list or the stuff. So here's our stuff again. It is indented and it's surrounded by white space, just like the paper finding aid, except not at all like the paper finding aid. Now we can teach a machine to read this as a hierarchy and all sorts of transformations can be enacted on this structured markup. If this is your first look at EAD, then welcome to the party. I'd like to point out that EAD gave us more than just the elements for encoding titles, dates, notes. EAD also had us encode other types of information, which you can see on the right and in the example provided. 
Here I've encoded a personal name. This will be important later on. These multiple types of information, people, places, corporations, corporate entities, were included in a singular EAD file. You can hear me starting to bring in our other concepts, singular versus multiple. So bear these other types of encoded info in mind as we move forward. Now a quick word about EAD3. EAD, the uh, previous example, debuted in 2002. EAD3, the current example, debuted in 2015. This is the name example from the last slide. EAD3, which debuted in 2015, now allows and probably encourages this approach to names. I'm starting a theme here, which is the breaking down of information into its smallest parts. For those wondering what EAD3 is all about, it's changes like this that are meant to better align with some of the concepts we're exploring. Now a word about normalization, another jargony word. EAD is kind of introducing those, all of those at once. Normalization also relates to our new theme, parsing information into discrete bits. That's the way computers want it. That way, we can tell computers what to do with it. Later, we'll be talking about atomization, which I think is a form of normalization. I did a lot of Googling on that and I still really couldn't get it right, but that's later. Right now, I'd like to point out that encoding did more than just wrap text with text. Super fast recap. Here's our paper dates. Now, here's our encoded dates. But these aren't normalized dates. They haven't been parsed into their smallest pieces. If you left them like this in EAD or exported them to another format, then you still needed your human brain to find info from 1954. You still need to interpret 1950 to 1955 with your brain and know that 1954 is in between them somewhere. We need to break these dates down further in order for them to be fully understood by the machine. And then we need a machine to actually do something with them. Okay, first, here's our normalization. That one date span has been broken into its smallest pieces. Well, this, is, this has been so much fun to talk about in the abstract, right? I can already feel your awesome vibes about machine readability. So let's see some action. I ingested two versions of the suitable example finding aid into AS. I actually encoded an EAD. In one example, I didn't normalize the dates, and in the other, I did. So then I searched for materials from 1954, the year my father was born. You can see here that ASpace allows you to search by a very particular year, so I really said I only want things that happened between 1954 and 1954. Very hard request. Only those. I got no results. But you and I know that that stuff is in there. So I went back and I re-ingested my normalized version of dates. And voila, I got those two results. Why two? Well, two is what we're going to talk about next. But the point is here that the machine was taking action on normalized dates. So any archivists in the room that have been normalizing dates for the last two decades, your time has finally come. AS leverages that normalization for you. AS can use that to create collection dates for you so that you don't have to hand calculate dates anymore. AS has also helped to normalize extent information. So now ASpace can calculate your extent for you instead of hand counting boxes. This example on the screen shows you that two record center cartons was calculated to 30 linear inches. You can customize that too to be feet, uh, cubic feet, cubic feet, linear feet, anything you want. It's math, it's awesome. Alrighty, let's return to our visualization. This is EAD, got it. This is where we left off with paper. And so now it's time to visualize the evolution into EAD. Are you ready? Boom. That is underwhelming, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's underwhelming for two reasons. One, our fake finding aid is extremely basic, so you can't really appreciate the hierarchy. Imagine instead that we had a proper finding aid with series and subseries and more levels of hierarchical description. So this shows you a bit more of the change. But eh, as a visualization, it doesn't do a good job of representing the revolution of display and transmission of description that came across the entire profession when EAD was introduced. It really was a game changer. But not as a visualization, admittedly. But 
there is something important about this visualization. Note the change in label from folders on the left to these components on the right. Remember earlier when I said that the first visualization didn't represent a conceptual change? This one does. If you are tempted to use your human interpretation, then please note that folders are not components. I am referring to the conceptual shift of the hierarchy from being a contents list or a list of physical materials to an intellectual hierarchy formed by encoding components. More jargon, I know. I know all of that is super jargony, but the change in vocabulary speaks to the change in concepts. Components identify logical sections or levels and don't always directly correspond to a folder or a physical entity. And that will be important as we move into databases and into conceptualizing this information. So EAD gave us machine readability and then enabled us to have machines act on structured markup. But it also gave us the shift away from describing folders to describing concepts. All right. Welcome to databases. Since I'm recording this in 2018 and the summary of this webinar says so, you assume correctly that my real intention is to introduce some of the concepts underpinning archive space. It may then be confusing that this slide does not say archive space. I have already lumped Archon, Archivist Toolkit, and Archive Space together. My point here is that archive space did not originate the conceptual shifts that I'm about to explain. What ArchivesSpace does is make you experience these concepts more acutely than databases used in the past. If you have never used an archival description database at all, then this will be all new territory for you. But take some comfort that some of your peers who did use those description databases may be just as affected by the perception of change as you are. I will circle back to this in our conclusion. Let's revisit our thesis. We've covered machine readable or actionable, and now it's time to really get into full conceptual transformation. We will be leaving the concept of a single document completely behind and entering the realm of multiple linked machine readable data points, which ultimately can be infinitely manipulated. Let the acceleration begin. Visual consistency is important. So here we return to this model. You'll note that paper is gone, but it lives forever in our hearts. I see databases have joined the party, and now that event horizon I was talking about. This is the change. The event horizon represents two concepts that together have huge effects on storing the archival description we know and love. These two things essentially happen simultaneously as we convert, not really a transition, from EAD into database tables. And remember, we can go from database tables back to EAD because data can be infinitely manipulated. The transition from singular to multiple is up first and is a result of atomization. Flat and linked, two things we haven't talked about yet, really will follow. Here we begin our two concepts, atomization and linking. Welcome to atomization. This may be the first or the 500th time you've heard that word. Note that atomization results in the transition from singular to multiple. I mentioned earlier that singularity is just the ratio of the number of collections to the number of documents that represent those collections, but we're not talking about documents anymore, so multiplicity is about to take center stage. Simply put, atomization means to break into atoms or to fragmentize. But isn't that what normalization was? No. Normalizing this data broke it, broke it into smaller pieces, but it didn't break it into separate pieces. I was introduced to the word atomization in this sense, the atomization of a material substance, such as paint. This is a rendering of the tip of a paint sprayer, and it's a good analogy because it's worth thinking about approaches to things based on scale. You have likely painted something, probably with a brush or a roller. I am fascinated by the way that bridges are painted, which is at an enormous scale. Painting with a brush does not scale up, but painting with a sprayer does. And the atomization of the paint is what makes that scaling up possible. You would never paint a bridge with just a small painting brush, but you would also not paint the inside of your living room with a giant pneumatic paint sprayer. Atomization is in the service of scale. So I needed screenshots for this presentation. 
I encoded the suitable example finding aid in EAD and then imported it into ArchivesSpace. Here it is as seen from the staff side of ArchivesSpace. It looks very familiar. I can already feel your human interpretation at work. Now my collection was literally the only thing in that repository because I was using the ArchivesSpace sandbox. So in this screenshot, AS says that I have one collection and six records. Well, I, I did have one collection, but what are the six records? This is evidence that my EAD finding aid was atomized or fragmented upon ingest. But really, what are the six records? Well, we usually think of collection and record as being synonymous. After all, this collection would only get one mark record in my OPAC or one entry in WorldCat. Well, the collection or the highest level of description is the collection listed. But the list of folders, which we now know EAD treats as a series of components, became the six records. I'm going to pause for a second and let that sink in for those of you who haven't thought of it this way before and take a drink of water. So don't worry, I'm going to walk you through this. Here are the three components, only three. I know we have six, but six wouldn't fit on the screen. Here are three components of our EAD finding aid. If this presentation is your introduction to EAD, then let me explain that this is a real screenshot from an XML editor, and this is what EAD looks like in the raw. Notice that there is now container information, or the box and folder numbers, encoded in our structured markup. Notice also that I forgot to normalize the dates in this example, but by the time I realized that, it was far too late, and the joke's on me. So, EAD and its machine-readable wisdom had us encode discrete In keeping with our earlier observations, this EAD file is still singular. It represents a multitude of things, but it is still, in and of itself, one thing. Archive space made one singular file into multiple records. I'm about to show you the actual atomization process that converted my finding aid. There it is. This is a GIF captured directly off my screen while Archive Space imported an EAD file. Now this is a much larger file than the one I've been using because that one would have been over in a hot second with only six components. This is a real finding aid. So it has much more, it's much more substantial than the example I've been using. I'm gonna pause and invite you to actually read this if you can. Every line that begins with created is creating a new, discrete, separate record. Watch. Now I'm going to pause on the very first uh, moment in that GIF, which goes by too quickly to read. I'd like to call your attention to the different types of records being created from one single EAD file. Remember the personal name from earlier that we encoded? That, along with a few others, are the first things being created. There's also one corporate entity, a number of subjects, two top containers, which we will get to a little bit later, and only after all those other records were created did it actually create the resource record or the collection record. This would be the record that actually had the title Suitable Example Collection. After AES created the resource record, it started creating the archival objects or the components. And I'll go back to that so that we can see it again. Repeat kudos to Laura Woodford for this GIF idea. So to return to our EAD example, we have these three discrete components. I'm going to switch analogies now and say that it's as if a tornado came through and tore your singular finding aid into little pieces. There are now components of your finding aid spread all across the county. But we forgot our resource record. So here begins another shift in vocabulary. OK, we have the suitable examples papers resource record in orange in the upper right to keep our visualization consistent. And we have our three components in blue. So the orange and the blue is still happening. Read the orange record for a second. That's describing the whole collection. You see the collection title, 
the call number, and the span dates. Then you have each one of the components. To further reinforce that these are now separate records, you'll see that I've included the URIs for these records as if they were in archive space. For those of you not yet in it, our A space or haven't never noticed, pay attention to the address bar as you click from one thing to another when you're in archive space. The address changes each and every time. It's a web-based interface, so that's not strange, but it shows you that you are moving from archival object number one, and you can read along with me, to archival object number two to three and that they are in three different places. Our resource record is in a fourth place. I'll pause there for a second. So you just heard me use a new term, archival object. Every component in your finding aid is now its own record, and that record is called an archival object. This means another label, cha label change in our visualization. I'll pause here a second too. These vocab shifts are not conceptually important. Well, not too much, I'm not gonna get into too far, but, we but they may trip you up. If I start referring to things as archival objects, when I was referring to them as components, and when prior to that, we kind of only thought of them as folders. So, what was a component is now an archival object. Back here, real quick, we have a new thing to consider. Notice again the container information. These are encoded elements about the box and folders, and the box is box one. Hope you can read that. So we have box one, folder one, box one, folder three, box one, folder two. The box itself gets its own record. And that record, as you can see from the URI, is called a top container. Another new vocabulary word. Every physical container gets its own record. It's called a top container to refer to the fact that things can be stored inside other things. So if you had microfilm reels inside small boxes, you might put those inside of a larger box. The point is that to find those microfilm reels, you needed to find the topmost box that they were stored in. Now I know that you can't click on a link in a webinar, but Maureen Callahan recorded some excellent introductions to this functionality in archive space. I highly recommend them if you're new to this idea, and so you can just Google Yale Container Management, you should be able to find them. Now if that all makes you squint a little, no problem. It is a entirely new concept. So I bet you have a boatload of boxes called box one. I hope you can see this, but the slide contrasts the fact that all these boxes are called box one, but they're still going to get their own URIs and their, or their own addresses. So imagine your own holdings, how many box ones you have. If they were all represented in archive space, they would each have their own address, like you see on the screen. I'll pause. Okay, stay with me people. We're back in familiar territory, but only briefly. We're gonna go from this familiar slide to this, to this, to just yeah, already. And we're gonna keep our colors, orange and blues, but now we're gonna switch visualization styles. Okay, we still have our suitable example collection. We have our correspondence, archival objects. We have that box one hanging out in the bottom. Now I'm going to switch the labels to take us away from our fake example and we're going to use the vocab. So resource, series of archival objects, top container. I'll pause one last time. All right, everybody. At this point, we are building momentum. Our engines are bogged down with torque and we are accelerating. We atomized our finding aid into separate records, one collection record or resource record, and three components or archival objects. We atomized our container information and created a separate record for just the box. This is a top container. Don't worry about the jargon if it's still confusing you, just follow the visuals. Now, though they are together on the screen and are here, 
there is no way for our database to know that these five records mean something together unless we link them and unless we link them in a meaningful way. And there they are, linked. The resource record is linked to the three archival objects and the three archival objects are linked to the container. I'm not going to pause on this visual because it's not technically correct, so if you're frustrated that I moved too quickly on this one, just hold on. I want to reinforce again that these are stored as five distinct records with five distinct locations. Only the links between them bring them back together again. Now, in this visualization, we can see the links between our resource and our archival objects. Awesome. Hold that thought. According to my thesis, our journey is now complete. We have moved from singular documents to infinite records, which is an exaggeration. I'm sure the archive space developers would love the idea of having to handle infinite records. We are linked. And we have moved to a place where computers are storing and delivering data for us. The computers run the show now. We have evolved the storage of archival description to the point where we can now properly leverage databases to store information in its smallest parts on our behalf so that it can be infinitely manipulated upon request. But I'm not going to leave you here. There are still some significant things to cover. We forgot our top container. Well, this is what visualizations are really for. It's all been leading up to this. This is how the top container links back to our archival object through a layer of concepts called instances that I haven't even mentioned. And frankly, that's a whole different webinar. What if we had another resource? And what if its archival objects or this resource has folders that are in our box one. Now, that one top container can be linked and linked and linked. And I'll pause here. If you're feeling disoriented, that's okay. It is kind of crazy. So welcome to the conclusion. Seems we got here kind of quickly. We're going to cover a little bit about infinite manipulation, collection management, the fact that this isn't new, but it feels that way, and some of my own personal final thoughts. Remember that infinite manipulation I keep talking about? If you've used any database, you know that having things in smaller pieces means that you can recombine them in different ways. Databases allow you to export to EAD. I have a teaser graphic here about exporting to CSVs or spreadsheets. You can export to PDFs, or you can just let Archive Space do the infinite manipulation for you and export to the public user interface, which will still feel new to a lot of you. But AS can display your data directly on the web on your behalf. This slide is a bit of a teaser because just because I say that you can manipulate it however you want doesn't mean that you know how, but at least you know that you can. If you hear talk about plugins for archive space, that is archivists saying, hey, I want this or I want my data to do this and AS doesn't do it for me. So they made their data do what they wanted by developing a plugin that works with archive space to do it for them. If you've heard of the API, which I'm not even going to touch, even though it's my favorite thing about AS, that allows you to interact, to interact and make massive changes across your data in a programmatic way. Again, because it's being stored in its smallest pieces, you can then manipulate it in its smallest pieces. And you could do this in the past with SQL tables, for those of you who know what that means, but now you can't actually break your database by using the API, we hope. Laura Woodford and I have tried to break stuff. APIs also allow AS to connect with other systems. And finally, all this encourages community development because as, the, as we come up with new and interesting ways that we want our data to be displayed or accessed or used, we come together and try to make that happen. But I know if you don't feel like that you're in that community, 
that's still a huge barrier. Collection management. The transition from document to data is parallel to another transition. The heart of our work is connecting researchers to information, but we also manage a lot. Databases aren't just repositories of finding aids, or the data formally conceived of as a finding aid. Databases allow us to manage our collections. Here is a visualization, which I'm hoping is accurate, of all the different record types available in archive space, at least as of May 2018. and how they relate to each other. Databases allow us to track collections, the records for people and subjects in those collections, the accessions that create the collections, information about their condition, which I point to there in the upper right, the assessments module. Also look at digital objects. ASpace allows us to manage information or relationships with digital content, both born digital and digitized. And then on the right-hand side, we have more and more data about the way we store materials. There's our containers, for instance. We also have container profiles, locations, locations profiles. These allow us to know where our stuff is, how big it is, how much space is still left on our shelves, all sorts of things. This complexity can feel overwhelming. But remember, atomization of information is in service to scale. You don't have to use each of these features of archive space, but if you have need for them, you'll see that the options expand to fit those needs. Let's return to this. I'll pause and let you get reoriented. Remember, the orange and blue were our original finding aid data. Now, I'm going to bring in some collection management records. I'll let you pause to read this, but you can see how other types of records are now connecting to what we formerly thought of as our finding aid information. And now, our acceleration may break the sound barrier. I'm about to show you your collection, six, still, still six archival objects of correspondence, still in one box, but after you've digitized it and connected digital objects to it. I'll also pause on that. Now, I may have lost you long ago. I hope you were wearing your seatbelt. Safety first when navigating conceptual shifts. So, this isn't new, but it feels that way. You may be saying, this isn't new? For some of you, this may be the weirdest thing I've said. Sure feels new to me. Well, again, that relates to what experience you've already had. If you're new to databases, you're right, this is very new. But if you're not, and here's a shout out to AT users. Do you remember all those fields? And specifically, do you remember that as you clicked from component to component, the window changed? Back in AT, you could only edit one thing at a time, one record at a time. Same as AS. Your data was already atomized in AT. It just didn't feel that way. And I apologize to those who weren't in databases before. But this was a huge pain point for me personally, and so if it's a pain point for other AT users, I just wanted to mention it. I kept asking myself, why does it feel so different from the way it used to feel in AT? I see the same words on the screen, and look, there's instances from earlier. Why does that feel so different in archive space than it did in AT? What's the deal? In developing this webinar, I thought really long and hard about this question, and I even asked much more tech-minded people than myself about it. The conclusion kept coming back to something that was sort of too obvious to be true, but I think it is true. It's just the way that we navigate that makes it feel different. AT kept everything on one screen. So very quickly, here's our visualization again. We know that we have a lot of complexity. 
That's just one collection, by the way. It's one collection, only one subject, only one agent, only one accession. It's a lot for only one small collection with only six folders of stuff in it, right? Well, if you think that's complex, take a look at what's really happening on the back end of archive space. That's a fraction of what's going on. And it and it's just as it went on behind AT too. So why, if it, this went on behind AT and this is going on behind AS, does it feel so different? Well, for me at least, it kind of feels like you're in a video game now. Because it's web-based and you need to click and then load and then click and then load to get where you're going, you more keenly feel like you're navigating from record to record to record. You have to navigate the atomization in a way that you didn't have to in AT. So, my final thoughts. I don't know where you are in regards to the work that you do. You may still be in school, or you may have been doing this for 40 years already. I hope that I've managed to relate to you the questions you can ask yourself about your work to determine where you are in thinking of descriptive information as a document or data. But there's something bigger going on for some of us in this field. For those of you who are completely new to this, you may feel like the gap between your work and the technologies you use to do your work has suddenly widened too far. This is also a gap between people because colleagues who easily embrace new technologies and those that are still experiencing the acceleration might be worlds apart. So this can be an empathy gap too. I'd like to take a moment to let you know that you're not alone, because I have felt this way many times myself. There may also be some people watching today who are on the other side of that gap and looking back. Those of you just entering or about to enter the field will face decades of legacy description back when this was all stored in documents. There can be tension in this direction too, which may lead to frustration and a lack of understanding. Mentoring relationships can suffer from this divide. Take a moment to consider that gap as well. It was my intention to do what I can to bridge that gap, and I want to encourage everyone on both sides and those happy in the middle to look both forwards and backwards with empathy and respect for each other and the work that we do. Finally, for those feeling hopelessly lost, I want to leave you with one last thought. Think of the stars. The stars, like data, are atomized, spread across the galaxy, hopelessly far away. But for millennia, humans have been looking up and drawing links between them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie, for sharing your insights on how finding needs have evolved and really bringing to light the incredible complexities that archivists face on a daily basis. We will now open up the floor for questions or comments on finding aids, atomization, normalization, archive space, and anything in between. Feel free to use the chat box, too. And apologies for oversimplification. <laughs> uh, Vivian Lee, I am going to be posting the recording of this and um, uploading the slides as well onto the wiki. Joan, I don't know if I'm fully qualified to answer that question. <laughs> the best I can say is that if you're talking about ingesting an EAD file, the EAD importer looks at the standardized format of your EAD file and then makes a series of decisions about which database tables this discrete piece of information goes into. But beyond that, I admit that I struggled enough with, uh, with trying to distill these things. So if there's anybody else in the audience who can better answer Joan's question about how normalization actually happens in archive space, I would love for you to chime in. Yes, Tom, so this is not my technology. Uh, I, I encourage you to Google it. So I've used it myself. What it does is you, uh, it's a web-based interface that you install locally on your, on your machine by going to the GitHub. And then uh, if memory serves, you can upload a Word document. It does its best to take some, some guesses 
you know, based on indents and white space. And then um, it's been a while since I've used it, but you can essentially sort of like draw boxes around, I think that's what it does. Whatever it does, it's a really nice graphical user interface for letting you tell Transmog what's the container list, what's the title, what's a this, what's a that, and then Transmog does its best guess based on what you've input. You're still using it's a combination of sort of like your human interpretation, your human interpretation, and Transmog's awesomeness that um, export you, I think, into XML. And it might not be perfect at that point, but it's much better, of course, than copying and pasting directly. So if I did not develop it, I'm probably slaughtering uh, the summary of it, but I, I do recommend, it's very easy to get into. Uh, I think that it comes with a with an installer. So it's not like you have to have special tech skills to use it or anything, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Well, Joan, just by entering the data into archive space, you're doing the normalization. So for instance, if you were to enter a date into archive space, you would be prompted for a, a date field and the date field would expand and say begin and end. So if you put in 1950 in that first field and 1955 in that second field, you've just normalized that date. You don't, it's, it's happening for you in a web form. You, you don't have to think about it happening behind the scenes. And I'll do a better job of uh, reading the questions each time if anybody has any more. Thank you for the feedback. It's my first time doing this. Any other questions? I don't see any traffic happening in the chat box. So um, if not, we can wrap things up. Thank you all for joining us today for this webinar. The recording of this webinar should be available by tomorrow, and the slides will be posted onto the wiki soon also. Thank you, and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. And remember, it was just an introduction little simplistic.